Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Brimacolm of Brimacolm & Associates. I am your architect of business growth and will work with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. <clears throat> Today, we're talking about starting a business in a recession, do's and don'ts. I want to thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Highland Bank, a locally owned community bank, and Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency. To participate in the comments section, make sure you are watching in YouTube. And while you're there, please hit the subscribe and hopefully even the like button. All right, that will uh, just take a moment. I'll wait for you to go do it. As a reminder, you can catch Clubby on your favorite podcast platform as well. With that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Chris Gurton, president of Sport Resource Group. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. And then a reminder to folks, you can find his contact info um, again in the comments field. But if you want to write it down right now, it is chris at sportresourcegroup.com. Again, chris at sportresourcegroup.com. All right, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, the firm, and the various things that you're up to these days. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I've honestly uh, benefited greatly from listening to and viewing events like this. And I'm excited to be on this side of the camera. Um, our, our company, my wife, Maria and I started Sport Resource Group in 2006. Uh, the idea was to be a resource for entities like parks recreation departments, campus recreation departments, and private training centers who wanted to buy packages uh, of sports equipment, scoreboards, turf, flooring, you know, bleachers, hockey dasher boards, and more. Uh, I'm actually uh, originally from Florida, and I uh, had a pretty good job down there in the mid-90s working for uh, Bob Nagley, who a lot of you will uh, know that name, uh, at a roller hockey company down in Miami. And uh, in the mid-90s, I worked for him. He asked me to come up here in uh, December of 1996 and uh, help him sell some hockey uh, dasher boards, which are, are the walls or the containment system. I, I worked for uh, Bob for about 10-plus years. We had a great run together. Um, and eventually, I just knew there was something else out there for me. I kind of felt trapped as an employee, as most entrepreneurs do. Just felt like there was something uh, uh, something else out there for me. So uh, Bob's company was changing. Uh, and uh, uh, so I started a distribution company with her blessing uh, February of 2006. So uh, almost uh, 15 years ago. The uh, uh, We'll get a little more into this later, but the first year was very successful. Um, we were able to take, instead of just hockey boards or soccer walls, uh, we were able to package that with uh, turf, um, scoreboards, et cetera. Uh, it was so successful, in fact, that uh, uh, although I was out on my own, uh, they, uh, they asked me to come back and uh, come back into the fold and show them how to do what I was doing. Uh, my wife and I had invested quite a bit of money in the business at the time, and we offered to sell it back to them at a uh, uh, nominal rate and uh, they declined. So uh, uh, I saw some really good friends over there. There, It's still an active company, but uh, 15 years later, uh, we're still arch rivals and, uh, and competitors. Well, uh, arch rival competitor um, sounds about uh, par for the course. Yeah. Um, hey, Chris, um, so we originally met through our kids. They were going to the same K through eight school um, I know that you're a very active dad, uh, as am I. Um, being an active dad and a business leader at the same time is not easy. Um, I always remember seeing you at all those events, um, as, as was I. How did you uh, juggle the challenges of, of both fatherhood as well as uh, your career? Well, uh, first of all, it takes, uh, you know, in my case, um, you know, it takes a great partner, a great support, uh, a great supporter. And uh, for me, that's my wife, Maria. We've been married uh, 17 years. Uh, so we met in 2001 and um, uh, got married in 2004. And uh, uh, so it's yeah, 17, almost 17 years. Uh, we had identical twins in 2005, uh, started this business in 2006. And then we had a son in 2007. So uh, uh, we joke uh, quite a bit that uh, this business is our fourth kid. Um, and the business sometimes has to share time with the three other kids. But uh, um, in all seriousness, uh, sometimes, you know, we treat uh, the business, unfortunately, like an only child, gets a lot of attention. But, uh, you know, for me and for us, it comes down to communication. 
uh, when you're running a company, and depending on what company it is, that maybe you can get out of there at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. on Wednesday. You know, maybe you can serve some pizza lunch or a subway um, at your kid's school. But, you know, there are a lot of weekends, you know, when other parents are home with their kids and I was on the road. I mean, one instance in particular, our biggest trade show of the year for summer camps is uh, mid-March every year. And this will be the first year they don't hold it. And I've uh, almost always missed my twin's birthday. And it's just a, uh, a fact of life and we celebrate it in other ways. But, um, you know, I think our kids, uh, the communication piece is key. And our kids understood that if either Maria or I, you know, missed a big family event, um, you know, it was because we were building something at SRG that would benefit them later. Uh, eventually we were able to uh, combine work and family in a variety of ways. Um, in years past, I've actually gone, uh, taken a West Coast uh, road trip uh, out to see some of my NHL teams. And, and uh, um, I was able to bring my daughter uh, a lot of those times. In fact, one time um, we were trying to get into a Staples Center, which is a tough arena to get into for, uh, for business. Um, and uh, I just couldn't penetrate uh, that arena. And we're, uh, we're in, I'd say we've probably sold the 28 of the 31 arenas and we just couldn't get in there. But um, no matter how hard I tried, uh, eventually my fr a friend of mine got hired out there at a pretty low level. And uh, my daughter and I went out there to visit him. And he was giving us a tour of the facility. It was probably four or five years ago. And I looked over and recognized the VP of the arena, the VP of ops, who was just a really, he's a good guy, but he just was really hell bent and, and uh, really uh, uh, dedicated to his current vendors. And I looked over and, and there's my 10 year old daughter uh, striking up a conversation with him. And, uh, and this is a guy who hadn't returned a call or email from me in, in years. Um, eventually, he I uh, got word that uh, he wanted my daughter and I to stay for the uh, um, for the game that night. He left us a couple of tickets in the founders suite, uh, all you can eat, all you can drink. So uh, just by kind of bringing her along, and I mean, I, obviously, this isn't you may not be able to do this if you're doing an IT project or uh, if you're doing a, a sales call on a on a doctor, but. A lot of businesses, I think, if you involve your family, um, you can kind of show the humanity of, of yourself and, and what you're doing. And um, I mean, I can't tell you how many road trips you know my kids have been on now, and uh, it teaches them a lot, and it uh, just shows the human side of your business uh, to a uh, uh, to a lot of the customers. So it's been great uh, to be able to combine work and business and, and family life in that way. So I have to. Add that. Your, your daughter helped you get that project. Uh, did you get a finder's fee? Oh, uh, sure. So, you know, it's funny. We got in there uh, on a very, very minor level, uh, but we're still not even close to where we are with a lot of the other arenas. But um, it, it broke the ice a little bit. Uh, I think her finder's fee, ironically, was uh, uh, she's not a biggest fan of the LA Kings. Uh, so I think her finder's fee was a, a hat from her favorite team. Uh, but uh, yeah, she, she enjoyed it. And, and I'll tell you, um, every year now they're a little bit older and we go do a project for the NHL at the all-star game. And uh, now they're the setup and the breakdown crew. So we can get into that later, but they actually work for our company, but, and when they're out there, it's uh, not all fun and games. The, the setup and, and the teardown can be pretty um, strenuous, uh, but they put in the hours like, like anybody else and they get paid for it. It's just been a really valuable life lesson. Good. Good. So obviously um, you've had a love of sports um, probably all your life certainly going back to your undergraduate uh, days, you got a degree in sports marketing. Tell us a little bit um, more about how you got started in the industry. And then you touched a little bit on how you, you came to uh, Minnesota, but given that you grew up, went to college and started your career in Florida, tell us a, a little bit more about how you ended up in Minnesota. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, I grew, like that, most kids or a lot of, at least a lot of kids growing up, I wanted to play pro sports and dreamed of playing pro sports. Uh, it came, became pretty obvious, um, you know, I wanted to play pro football, and uh, it became pretty obvious after my mom wouldn't let me play any football at all that I probably wasn't going to make the jump right to the NFL after having never put on the pads. Um, so I switched around, and I, I decided I wanted to become a team doctor or team trainer, and um, you know, that was my goal going into college, and, and I was going to be uh, pre-med. I had an academic scholarship to college, um, and uh, so I was very fortunate there that um, I was able to go to college with room and board uh, down in South Florida uh, for free. My first uh, semester of uh, pre-med, um, or at the end of my first semester, um, I had a pretty low GPA and in no uncertain terms, I uh, was told you know, my scholarship was in jeopardy. So I uh, 
pivoted over to something I loved, which was business. And uh, in the business school, just fell in love with marketing. Um, this was the early 90s in, uh, in South Florida. And, um, you know, as luck would have it, uh, the Miami Heat had just come on board as an expansion team in the NBA uh, in the late 80s. But uh, the Florida Marlins, the Florida Panthers, so Major League Baseball, Major League or NHL were expansion teams that hit, you know, my senior year. Uh, there were a plethora of uh, college bowl games. So uh, the football games that, you know, used to take place over Christmas and New Year's. Um, and then uh, there's a pro tennis circus, uh, pro tennis circuit, which was called the Lipton. There was a pro golf circuit, which was um, back at the time was the Doral Ryder Open and then the Weston uh, tournament the next weekend. So, you know, all of those tournaments needed minimum wage workers. And, uh, you know, that was the only way to get any experience at all. And, you know, this is a, uh, it's an interesting business as sports because you really, um, unless your dad owns a team, um, you know, you're not getting in there at the, at the top level at all. You're, you're starting at the bottom, working their way, working your way up. Um, I think my first year, uh, my first gig was a college bowl game and um, they offered me $500. And uh, first I thought it was 500 a week and then I thought it was 500 a month, but it was 500 total. So I think I literally lost more money in gas driving back and forth, you know, to that three month gig. But, uh, you know, from there, a friend who worked there got me in with uh, Marlins and I did a, a public relations, media relations internship, which was the Florida Marlins at the time. Uh, now they're the uh, Miami Marlins. Um, and that was 1994. So if you remember, um, there was a strike shortened year, labor stoppage. Uh, they um, uh, uh, canceled the World Series that year. So uh, September of 94, uh, I was out of a job and uh, that's when I found a, uh, a gig uh, with uh, Mr. Mr. Nagley's company um, down in Florida and was there for two or three years before I moved up here. All right. Well, we were just before we got started talking about the cold weather that's coming in. Do you still uh, um, pine for the days of being in Florida with the warmer weather than what you have up here? Or have you uh, completely acclimated and now hockey uh, has grabbed you? Well, I love the sport of hockey, but uh, I'll tell you, the year I moved up here, it was... Uh, um, I think it was, it was the coldest winter still uh, in the last 20 years. So it's only gotten easier since then. But um, we're definitely, uh, all three of my kids were born here. Um, we live on a, uh, a pond. My uh, son has a rink back there. He shovels off every day. Uh, my daughter, one daughter's a downhill skier. Uh, they just love the outdoors. And uh, I'll, take, I'll take a January uh, in Minnesota every day before I would take an August in Miami. So... Fair enough. Good to hear. Say, um, question, uh, my experience has been many um, entrepreneurs have a family member or family friend that was an entrepreneur, somebody that could act as a role model or a mentor. Um, did you have anyone like that? And then also, um, when you thought about kind of your career, when did you first figure out that you wanted to start your own company? Well, um, yeah, eventually I did. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Nagley, Bob Nagley, who uh, was, you know, helped uh, uh, build Rollerblade and became, became the name behind uh, uh, the Minnesota Wild and, and many other entities, ended up becoming my mentor. But um, that was, uh, uh, but growing up, um, you know, I had my, uh, my dad was uh, a company man and he, he lived for it. He, he, uh, uh, he was an eight to five guy. He loved the security of it. Um, and uh, he wouldn't change it for the world. And I, I think that's when I realized that some people are born, you know, born that way. And, and I was born a different way. You know, my dad uh, was uh, uh, did ROTC in the Navy in college. Uh, he served the Navy for 20 years. He taught Navy ROTC for 17 years. So, you know, he, he wore the Navy uniform every day for 41 years. And, and I'll never forget him saying he loved every day he woke up, he knew exactly what he was wearing. So there was no, there was, you know, there was no shirt, you know, collar shirt, t-shirt, sweatshirt, but, uh, you know, for him, that was the definition of security. And he was able to uh, provide for, you know, we had, it was him and uh, my mom and four kids and he provided great life for us. And, uh, um, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted. I, I didn't really uh, like the predictability of it. I kind of thrived on the um, unpredictability of it. Uh, growing up, um, my brother and I had rival mowing businesses. So same neighborhood two different mowers and we had rivals and, and then we, on weekends, we'd uh, get together and believe it or not, we would sell donuts. So uh, that was back in the day when uh, Krispy Kreme uh, wasn't that well known and uh, you could go door to door 
and we would take orders um, for, you know, uh, uh, 50, it was $2. Uh, for a dozen donuts, we'd take the money on a Wednesday or Thursday. We'd buy the dozen for a dollar. My mom would drive the minivan. And uh, then on Saturdays, we would just hustle, deliver our donuts. And after a full day of work, we each make 25 bucks. And uh, um, obviously, the money the money part of it was nice. But I just always loved the challenge of uh, talking to somebody face-to-face -face and trying to make a sale. I've always believed sales to be win-win. You know, I'm not trying to get one over on somebody. We're providing a product, even to this day. At a fair and at a fair price, um, and uh, you know, I was doing it for other other companies, and I just realized I was really, really good at the sales part of it. Uh, but all the money was going to somebody else, and it just I felt like uh, um, you know, I, I felt like I could do it better. And in fact, before I left my previous company, you know, a manager said had kind of said to me, uh, "If you think you can do this better, I'd like to see you try." And uh, I'm a pretty stubborn person and pretty competitive person, and I took that to heart and. Uh, um, you know, that's kind of what eventually, you know, got me out the door. So talk a little bit about that process must've been a little challenging to do that. How did you go about, um, extricating yourself? Um, how did you just navigate, uh, those waters? Well, you know, at the beginning, it was interesting because, uh, uh, we each needed each other. Um, so it would be like any other company that, that has a distribution or a sales problem, you know, they needed, needed me as a salesperson and, um, honestly, I didn't have a product to sell, so I needed them as a manufacturer. So at the, at the very beginning, it, became, it was a blessing. And I left on my own, and rather than be a sales rep for them, I just uh, started my own distributorship. Um, they, were looking to, you know, the, they were looking to shed salaries, um, and I became their official sales rep in the southeastern uh, U.S. But, um, you know, like I said before, you know, once my template was in place of what you know, Marie and I were doing, where we could go into a venue. I remember one in, in Nashville and the guy called us for a set of hockey boards for, and then would have been maybe $50,000. Uh, we sold them the boards, the flooring, the scoreboard, the bleachers, the netting, the rubber flooring, you know, and all of a sudden we went from, that was a $50,000 project originally. And I walked out of there, you know, with uh, a $200,000 sale. And so we knew what we had worked and there's no doubt, you know, still no doubt in my mind. Um, and then we were so successful that the company said, Hey, after a year, they said, you know, we made a mistake letting you go. We want you to come back. Um, show us how to do what you're doing. Show us how to go nationwide with these project sales. And, um, you know, Marie and I had put quite a bit of money into the business. And I remember saying to them, hey, just, you know, give me a nominal fee. I think it was five, 10, 15 grand, buy our business and, and I'll happily come back. Um, and they just weren't, uh, uh, it didn't work out. So, we unfortunately had to go the legal route um, for a year and a half, and we fought it out in court. We settled it amicably after about eight, 18 months. And, you know, I mean, I, you always hear people who start a company with nothing. People start with zero or, you know, scratch the other A, B, or C. But, um, yeah, I always tell people, hey, you know, we start our company six figures in legal debt. So if you're starting with nothing, you're already six figures ahead of where we were. Uh, but, you know, still to this day, that was the – uh, price we paid, you know, for our freedom. And that's what we, that's the price we paid to uh, be free and clear of uh, any, uh, um, uh, you know, basically uh, any legal uh, entities and and uh, we were free to go on from there. So uh, we, like I said, we eventually when it all settled, uh, we settled it amicably. They're happy with how it ended. I'm happy with how it ended and we've gone on our ways. Well, that's a big lesson for everybody out there listening and watching um, to start, as you said, six figures in the hole compared to starting with nothing uh, puts it all in perspective. So uh, congratulations on, on digging out of that. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it takes, uh, you'll see, I'll talk about this later. It takes a team and I couldn't have done it on my own, but we had the right teammates in there legally and, and uh, they allowed us to uh, take some time paying it back. But it also was a blessing, but it really made us lean and mean. You know, we couldn't go out there and uh, open a giant corporate office. And, and we really, really had to um, uh, struggle uh, to take out all the business we could, which was a blessing and a curse. But yeah, we did what we had to do uh, to, uh, to pay everybody back, which we did. Sure. Well, I'm sure uh, you learned some lessons or uh, had some valuable uh, mistakes that caused you to get better going back to the uh, lawn mowing days and the selling Krispy Kreme donuts. But from the professional 
uh, business uh, experience. Were there some mistakes that you made early on that you think others can learn from? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the biggest thing was, uh, you know, we didn't start out with a value, values or mission statement. You know, we really tried to be something we weren't. And we were trying to be, uh, we wanted everybody to think we were the giant company, uh, super impressive. And uh, uh, I mean, for example, the first year in business we rented, you know, we rented a big suite at the Wild Game for uh, a Christmas party. And, you know, that's not who we are, but, you know, it just in, in the back of my mind, I wanted to show people, you know, that we had made it. Um, so we were showing off and, uh, um, and we incurred a very, very large expense. And, and I remember, remember at the time, a, cu- a couple of customers kind of looking at me and thinking, you know, where's their money going? Is this where their money's going? So uh, the biggest thing was not trying, you know, try not to be something you're not, stay humble and stay honest on, on uh, what you're doing. But, um, you know, another mistake is, uh, um, you know, hiring. And uh, I think this is a big uh, mistake that a lot of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs make. And whether it's out of fear, uh, they either hire uh, too many people or not enough. Uh, but another, you know, another pattern you'll see is a lot of entrepreneurs hire their friends, somebody they're comfortable with. Our first employee was a friend of a friend. Uh, it wasn't a good fit at all, but it was comfortable. And it lasted longer than it should have. And, and I think nowadays, what we've learned, what a lot of people will tell you is hire slowly. So make sure it's something, you know, somebody you need, but fire quickly. And that just means in a good way, if it's not a good fit, you need to get rid of the person for your own, uh, you know, for your own reasons. But also, if it's not a good fit for that person, you're freeing them up to go find what they're really meant to do or to go find their next job. And, and as most people who, if you've ever let somebody go, it's always 36 hours of just uncomfortableness, whether it's a knot in your stomach or just, you know, just pressure. But after 36 hours, you know, you'll know if you made the right decision or not. Um, you know, I think another one was to delegate. Um, there are a lot of jobs I'm not good at. Um, I am good at selling. Selling is, you know, my number one ability. And, um, you know, if, if my head is buried in QuickBooks or if it's in, uh, you know, buried in our newsletter, I'm not selling. And, uh, you know, it's certainly you have to wear multiple hats early on. But even now, you know, my newsletter guy is a guy I pay a hundred bucks a month to, and I found him on next door. He, you know, he wrote, he writes one newsletter a month for a couple hundred bucks. It goes out to 35,000 people. And I mean, for a hundred dollars to reach 35,000 people, that return on investment is incredible. But if I was writing that myself, it would take me 10 times longer because I'm not a good writer. Um, so, I mean, I, th- I think not being all things, all people, it's just impossible as a small business. Um, and uh, just trying to make sure that uh, you know, you're honest to yourself. Uh, there's a lot there. I took several notes. Um, uh, and the one I totally agree with the hire slow, fire quick. <clears throat> Another way to do it is you can fire them now or fire them later. Once you have uh, reached the point that it's not a fit, um, you know, you just have to move forward. Yeah. And I agree. I agree. I mean, one of the best people we ever let go um, has rocketed up at a, another you know, plastics company, not ours. And uh, I mean, literally, I can tell you this uh, the guy has a, a leadership spot in a multinational company. He's probably 20 years younger than me, and it is astonishing. Had he held on with me, he never would have had that opportunity. So it sounds selfish or self-serving to say, but by freeing him up and getting him out of where we were, uh, I mean, the guy has just had an incredible career simply because of uh, you know the change of scenery. Sure. So the flip side of uh, that, lessons from uh, maybe mistakes or, or things that didn't go as well, what about some of the successes you've achieved, uh, learnings you've had along those lines? Um, what are some things that, that you think you could share with others that would be to their benefit? Uh, you know, I think uh, for me, it's, and I'm not very good at this, but it's uh, over-communicate. And that does, it doesn't matter if that's your family, if that's your uh, uh, employees, uh, if it's your customers, um, and not just once. I mean, just constantly, constantly over-communicate. Um, you know, uh, one thing we... Tried, used to try to do is, you know, uh, we would try to rush a project to somebody and we say, hey, we'll have it to you in a couple of weeks because we knew they were opening in a couple of weeks. And meanwhile, they may have dragged their feet for six months and not ordered on time. Um, but every, I mean, almost every day now when it comes to uh, communication, you know, we just try to set realix, realistic expectations, you know, for our customers. Um, so like I said, in the early days, we always wanted to impress. Uh, we almost always promised 
expedited timelines for our projects. And we'd work really, really long, long hours to meet those goals. And it just, uh, we would burn out. And what I realized later on is as long as you give your customer, you know, a realistic t- a timeline, you know, then they accept it. And that's, you know, happening even, you know, today or tomorrow. You know, if uh, somebody needs a drawing or wants a project, we tell them they'll have it in a couple of days and they do. But it's when you, uh, if you don't communicate exactly what's happening, you know, that's where you get in a lot of trouble. But I find most people are really understanding um, if you're just upfront and honest with them. Makes sense. Say, um, shifting gears a little bit, I know you're a fan of peer-to-peer coaching groups. Uh, we here at Club E have partnered with Min Big, the website's www.minnbigbig.com. Um, talk to the audience a little bit about how you've benefited from your experiences in peer-to-peer groups. Well, I think you're right. I mean, it's incredibly important to surround yourself you know, with a peer group, in fact, you know, that's, uh, you know, although our kids, we met through our kids a long time ago, I think that's one way uh, you and I have, you know, stayed in touch. Um, and I mean, it could be anything. It could be some people pay to belong to a peer group. Uh, some people are in a casual, you know, industry group. Uh, and the biggest thing for me is you'll never live long enough, nor do you want to, you know, make every mistake I mean, and learn from it. You have to go to people and surround yourself with people who have, whether it's some of the same worries or same of the, some of the same goals that you have. Um, you know, and it, it, it doesn't mean if you make a commitment to, I mean, it could be, it could be men big, it could be, you know, could be Toastmasters, could be the Rotary Club. You're not signing a lifetime contract. So if it doesn't work out um, and it's not a good fit, you can move on, but you don't know until you try it. I mean, for me as an entrepreneur, your know, work is usually when I open my eyes in the morning, it's the first thing I think of. You know, then I'll go spend time with the family and, and get ready. Um, you know, at night, it's one of the last things on your mind. So, um, you know, your your former college roommate, you know, your sorority sister, you know, your frat brother, um, you know, your next door neighbor is never going to understand the pressures that you have as a business owner. I mean, you know, it's a, a lot of people will say, you know, basically just having knowing you're responsible for so many paychecks or a big payroll every other Friday um, can be debilitating. So you really need to find a way to uh, have a resource, somebody you can call on, you know, any any uh, time or day or night. But it's also not something you can develop the day you need it. You know, the, the very first time I had a question on uh, a, a banker or the P, you know, the first or second round of the uh, PPP loans, you don't, I wouldn't be able to go out and join a group that day and get answers. So that's why you have to develop it, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in advance. I mean, I, I think there's an older saying, you know, uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Uh, it's just a lot of people, um, they're looking to you for leadership. Yeah, they're looking or to a paycheck and that you've got to remain you know, mentally healthy in, in order to, to lead. So um, speaking of leading, uh, business has been up and running now for about 15 years. So over that time frame, how has Sport Resource Group uh, changed and um, how is it different today from what you started roughly 15 years ago? Well, I mean, the 2006 uh, SRG would not recognize the 2021 SRG, and I I think that's uh, that's good. And I think it's something that people are starting business early on in their business. It's okay uh, not to know what your business is going to look like in 10 or 15 years. And that's perfectly natural. Um, I mean, just you know, I, I think. What is it, uh, 1995 or so, or whenever, 95, 96, when Amazon started selling books? I mean, you know, you had absolutely, you know, uh, nobody thought they'd be delivering celery, you know, 20 years from now. It just, you know, from where they started out to where they're going, we started out distributing other people's products. We had absolutely no proprietary products of our own. Um, and when the recession hit, which is, uh, I mean, times are tough, and this is 2007. Um, and this would be exactly like what's going on now, you know, with uh, uh, with COVID. You know, business was tough, and the Great Recession hit. The very first thing our manufacturers did, the people we represented, is they went around our backs and they went direct. And um, we, it was illegal, but you know, we could fight them in court. We didn't have the money for that, so we were absolutely out of luck uh, until we had to. Uh, you know, we had to develop our own product. You know, they they at the time thought, oh, if they could just. Uh, make up for fewer sales with higher margins, they could cut out the middleman. You know, they weren't set up 
uh, for direct sales and, and they burned a bunch of bridges. Um, Marie and I had been working on ideas of our own. And in fact, at the time, I remember we went to our uh, accountant for CPA and uh, you know, we both cashed out our 401ks. And, uh, and this guy said to us, this is the worst decision I've ever heard. In fact, he said, if you do this, I'm done. I won't work with you guys anymore. But we didn't have a choice. And so we cashed our entire retirement and we, uh, we built the molds we needed for this business. Uh, you know, two years later, the, or a year later, the stock market tanked. And he called us and asked us uh, how we were so wise to, to uh, time the market, but uh, we weren't that lucky. We just knew what we needed to do and we did it. Um, and then, uh, you know, as our distribution uh, uh, sales declined, we were finally able to start selling our own proprietary products uh, directly. And that remains uh, to be, you know, that's what we do to this day. But uh, that's not how we started the company, but we found something that worked and stayed with it. Say a uh, reminder to our, our audience out there to um, submit their questions in the comments field. If you're in YouTube, uh, we uh, do have some questions. We're gonna hold those till the end today. Um, but again, if you'd like to submit your comments, put it in the uh, field there, we will try to get to it. Similarly, um, Chris's email address is there as well. And then last but not least, again, hit the subscribe and like button. Um, all right, so uh, 15 years go by, the business is way different from what you started, took a lot of risks, some things worked, a few things didn't. Um, as you look back, what um, would you say is the most surprising thing or the, the biggest challenge or change that you faced over that time period? Uh, that's a good question. I would say the, um, certainly the internet. Uh, the internet, and that, it sounds obvious, but uh, um, you know, it, it's how the internet continues to change. And when I started this business, you know, it was, email was okay, you know, uh, but you know, when I started this business, I, I could go uh, buy a list of uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people and uh, I'm one of the rare people I'm at. If you gave me a list with names and phone numbers, I'm in heaven. I love calling people, talking to people, and I would just go down that list and sell. Um, but now, you know, people don't want a phone call anymore. You know, the, the whole idea behind a store on your website is, you know, no, you can't call somebody and say, come to my store. But if they're looking at two in the morning, your store better be open. Um, so the big answer is how the internet, you know, continues to change. I mean, we um, we went from one full-time employee at one point we had a salesperson and then, uh, probably, uh, seven or eight years ago, we took that money and we put all of that money, you know, into our, our Google ads back where it was called back in the day, Google ads. And, um, and that was it. But then, uh, SEO, then SEO came on where you could begin to, uh, make your ads more attractive and, uh, uh get your ads near, 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 you know, near the top. And then, um, you know, once that, uh, um, live this life and it's still useful, uh, then you had to switch over to organic. And so now, um, you know, it is a constant, constant battle to always be updating your website, making sure it's relevant. Uh, so it's Google ad, it's Google ad campaigns, there's a Google spend. Uh, we have the search engine optimization, you know, the organic search. You know, we're at a bit of a disadvantage because most people don't know we exist or our product exists. So if you wanted uh, uh, to build a hockey or a soccer or a uh, lacrosse system that's portable, um, you wouldn't even know where to start. So uh, a lot of our business is educating people. Um, and then once they find our business, you know, you've got to lock them in. Um, you know, I, I think another thing is really the blending of weekdays and weekends. And I think a lot of people feel this, that with the uh, proliferation of mobile phones, I mean, I get calls, texts, emails, uh, Saturdays, Sundays. And um, for a long time, I mean, I, I took all those calls and I'd be at baseball games and basketball games and uh, ski events and, I'd be on my phone with customers and thinking, oh, if I didn't get back to them, you know, they'd move on to somebody else. Um, yeah, I, I think I've done a pretty good job in the last year and a half of, of pairing that back. Um, if I get it, if, if it's an emergency and, and you know, we just had a giant lacrosse tournament in Louisville, uh, you know, I told those guys, hey, call me anytime. It was this past weekend. Um, and uh, they didn't call, but I would have taken their call. But um, as I'll tell you, it takes a lot of self-discipline as well to uh, resist the urge to return a call or an email on a Saturday or a, sun or a Sunday if you're trying to spend time with loved ones um, because it's so easy. And, and a lot of times it's emotionless where you can just get back to somebody real quick. You feel like you're doing something, but you know they say about multitasking, there's really no such thing. You're either 
you're either present with your customers or you're present with your family. You know, rarely can somebody do both. Well, speaking of uh, loved ones, uh, let's go back to where we started our conversation today, that being uh, your family. How have you and your wife remained business partners and remained uh, married and sane and hopefully happy uh, as you've been running the company? Um, I know that's not easy. How did you juggle those roles, um, that being a business partner and a spouse? Well, uh, she's great. Uh, I mean, she's just the, uh, an amazing, uh, uh, supportive, you know, human being. And, uh, uh, you know, we like any marriage, you know, we've had our uh, disagreements over the years, like any business partner, uh, we've had our disagreements over the years. Um, I'd say it's pretty rare that we're ever not getting along as spouses and business partners at the exact same time. Um, you know, so that helps some as well. And, uh, the last thing you're going to say is say something, uh, I mean to somebody you're about to go see in the office 15 minutes from now. So that helps too. But, uh, um, you know, in work, we have very defined roles. Um, I would say in, in some instances, um, we may not have to talk uh, for a few for a few, few hours at a time. Um, I handle all the money coming in. I handle all the sales. Um, and uh, she handles all the money going out. And that's the accounting, the financing, uh, the uh, bookkeeping. Um, I'm pretty good at what I do. I mean, sales-wise. And, uh, you know, she's very, very good at what she does, but uh, she came to it from a, she was a medical sales recruiter when we uh, met and started dating. Uh, she very unselfishly you know, gave up her career um, and jumped into the numbers, you know, which I don't enjoy. She didn't particularly enjoy at the time um, when we started the business. So it's been great kind of having uh, a co-owner uh, on the spending side of things because you hear so much about double billing and, and uh, larceny and theft and, People who control that checkbook can, you know, take take off with some of your money. So, you know, obviously, I never have to you know, worry about that. But uh, I, mean, I think for us, the key is uh, we have a marriage meeting every single week, and that's on a Friday between 10 and 10, 15 a.m. Uh, and if, in fact, I think if I recall, one of the couple of times we saw you, you know, we used to go to the Dunn Brothers on 34th and head from there. But it is a marriage meeting is basically we meet off site. We don't meet at home. We don't meet at work. Uh, it's usually in a coffee shop. Uh, it's a professional meeting, uh, just like you'd be meeting anybody else. We're both on time. You know, you bring a pad of paper, a pen, whatever you need. Um, you know, we go over the family and the business schedule for the next seven days. And it, it is just facts. And I put this on the schedule. She puts that on. Who's taking the kids, where they're taking them. Uh, and then it'll, after that, it goes to, hey, how's the business? What's going on? How can we help with the business? Any big projects going on? Um, if there's something going on with one of the kids, if there's... Uh, um, you know, a field trip coming up, or if it's honestly, if it's a big uh, vacation coming up. So these uh, marriage meetings, I mean, I can feel, and our whole family can feel it when these meetings don't take place. It's just, you know, kids get left places. It's just disorganized. Um, and when they do get made, when we do make those meetings, they uh, really tends to be uh, a well or smoother uh, week for the family. Mm -hmm. All right. So a reminder to everybody that you can submit a question if you're in YouTube, um, do have a couple that we're going to look at here real quickly. One from Regina talked about um, uh, balancing the need for income while simultaneously trying to both start and grow and then ramp a business. How did, how did you balance, um, balance your cash needs? Well, you know, the old saying is uh, whatever you think you're going to make your first year in business, you know, cut it in half. And whatever you think you're going to spend, double it. So uh, you got to be realistic right out of the gate of uh, of what you're gonna, of what needs to be done. Um, you know, for me, uh, we were lucky that we still had a little side business going. We were distributors for a year as as, as we got up and running. But um, you know, the I always say there's two ways to think of it. You know, how much income do you need, um, and then why do you need that income? You know, are there ways you can cut down, you know, cut down on spending? Um, you know, we started our business on the, um, you know, in the attic of our house from the attic. Uh, then we went to a, a spot in uptown, which uh, had mold and it flooded and it was, you know, 500 bucks a month. Um, you know, from there we bought a building, but you know, this is uh, just last year we got into a uh, four, about 5,000 square foot office warehouse. Um, and that would have been uh, 14 plus years after we started. So I think it's just being realistic and, um, you know, the more you can save up ahead of time for any additional income source, even if it's a, if it's a side 
hustle um, is uh, is big. And, and I certainly um, really, really respect people um, who are working with the, uh, you know, the VCs. Uh, we didn't need any uh, the startup the money we needed to get going. You know, we uh, we create ourselves and and, and uh, we kept um, ownership uh, of the company. Yeah, you know, but there are other um, you know opportunities out there to work with some great uh, you know VCs just to uh, uh, just to get started. Uh, question question from Matt. Um, not so much like a regret, but at some point in your journey, did you you face a fork in the road and you picked one side and. And in hindsight, do you ever wonder kind of what that other side would have been? Was there any tough choices that that pushed you one way or another that um, uh, upon reflection you maybe would have done differently? Yeah, I think, uh, as I said, maybe in the beginning when we were trying to be all things to all people, uh, I had a, a friend who was building an ice rink in uh, Fresno, California. And uh, our biggest project to date by then was twenty or $25,000. Yeah, we bid on this project. It was two hundred and ninety thousand um, dollars. We uh, we built it. We manufactured it. We went out there. We installed it. Um, we uh, every single thing that could go right did go right, and uh, we broke even on the project after maybe six months. It was an incredible learning curve. You know, I came home ready to sign my next project, and we had not uh, worked our phones, worked our leads. We had not. Um, sown any seeds whatsoever uh, for future sales in those six months. And uh, I think we went almost three months without a sale after that because I was so hellbent on sticking it to the previous company, showing them I could build an ice rink. That wasn't our core competency. And we really, really, really missed out on a lot of potential sales uh, that way. So, you know, that was probably, uh, it was a life lesson. So I don't know if I necessarily re regret it. Um, but uh, there were some hard times after that uh, because we got away from who we said we were going to be. So you talked about um, your evolution and, and there's been twists and turns and a lot of progress. Um, as you look forward, um, what changes do you see happening either for you or in the industry over the next couple of years? Um, you know, I think for us, certainly when it comes to uh, um, changes in the industry, um, you know, I think, you know, we are a business that uh, uh, we provide sports to kids and adults and our other business is netting. So we provide uh, protection to spectators. As you can imagine with COVID right now, there is absolutely nothing happening with youth sports, adult sports. Um, so it's been, uh, it, it's been, you know, we, we've really borne the brunt of a lot of these, uh, a lot of these shutdowns. Uh, but I think, you know, for trends I see moving forward, um, you know, one thing I see is the uh, uh, private, uh, private training, uh, private clubs uh, for kids, for, for youth sports. So uh, I think the parks and recreation, the YMCA, the school model, um, is going away. And it's, I think that's, it's really, really sad. I think it's bad for sports in general, but, um, you know, if you can't, uh, if you can't change it, you, know, you got to adapt to it. So, um, I think, uh, soccer is, uh, soccer, uh, and lacrosse seem to be the really two big, biggest growth areas we have. And, and there are just going to be kids playing year round soccer, year round lacrosse, uh, these training centers, uh, the private training, um, is just going to be insane. And, um, you know, I think a lot of these places will uh, continue to, uh, if there's a demand, they're going to serve it. And, and the demand is certainly there from parents right now. So that's probably, that's going to be a really, really uh, big change. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think in the next probably uh, 18 months, I think once there's a uh, um, herd immunity or We're going to see parents spending, they're going to spend all, all 2020's money and 2021's money on their kids. And it is going to be, uh, I think there's going to be a big, big push for funding uh, into uh, youth sports levels. A question about these private clubs. Um, would that change have happened anyway? Or is it just a reaction to COVID? Um, you know, it's a big kind of thought to say uh, schools, Park boards, YMCA's are going to become less important. So, uh, was that going to happen anyway, or did COVID um, push it forward? 
Well, I think it definitely would have happened anyway. I mean, I think just in general, um, just looking at, looking at you know my own kids, um, you know, there's uh, you know my son plays lacrosse, and you know, at any given time, he has his choice of three different teams, and um, you know, in spring or summer, and and uh, uh, while he has the most fun, you know, with his Minneapolis uh, with the Minneapolis kids, um, you know, he's uh, there's better coaching. Uh, certainly, and uh, um, you know, you get to, uh, better coaching, better tournaments, better players, better competition. You know, at, at the private or, or high school level. So um, I think it would have happened anyway. Uh, COVID is probably going to speed it up, uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, the amount of money that parents are about to spend on their kids, and, and this is summer camps, it's theater camp, uh, it could be tutoring. So it's not just limited to sports. Um, it is, um, I, I think it's going to really, really uh, take a lot of people by surprise. So if you have a business that caters to that whatsoever, um, I think um, there's going to be a, some real uh, uh, advantages there and some opportunities. Okay. Question um, from Kevin. Uh, Kevin would like to know what are your goals uh, for 10 or maybe even 20 years from now? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, eventually, um, you know, what, what I do is, uh, what I'd love to do is, is, is build up the company, uh, you know, work with, um, you know, work with somebody uh, larger in the industry who could take it over. Uh, and then I, you know, and then I retain a, a smaller percentage in it, but stay involved in it. And, um, you know, I truly, truly love, you know, what I do every day. I mean, there, there are, um, you go in and, and, uh, talk to people a lot. We work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are building, uh, you know, soccer, soccer or, or lacrosse programs around the country. And this is their dream. They're quitting their nine to five jobs. They're quitting, you know, their kind of jobs that they're bored at and they're saving up and then we're working with them to kind of build some dreams. So uh, I think one, one of our big advantages would certainly be to, uh, um, uh, to find somebody to help us make it bigger. Uh, we've done a lot uh, recently a non-sports. So, uh, if you watch WWE on Wednesday nights, which is WWE NXT, uh, that whole perimeter around the ring where they have fans in there, uh, those are our boards. Our boards are glass uh, as, as protection. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the military where we've um, uh, built uh, mini houses out of our boards that canines can sniff through. And the beauty of it, because our boards are interchangeable and versatile, you can make them different shapes and sizes. They don't have dogs going in the exact same house over and over again they can reconfigure our boards overnight and make the house look completely different. So that's, uh, we've worked with the military on that. So, um, you know, I'd like the opportunity, you know, if my, if my kids who are 15, 15 and 13, if they want to work in the industry and right now they say they don't, you know, which is fine, but if they wanted to, you know, I'd love to find a way to work with them, but uh, it wouldn't be immediately. I, I, I'd find a way for them to hopefully get out do something they love, find, find what they're passionate about. Um, and then other than the final thing, we've done a lot of international sales um, in the last uh, probably six to nine months. So I'd like to really grow the product internationally and get the product you know, overseas you know, a lot more than we've already done. Another question on the uh, professional sports front. Um, as you look at professional sports, you made some predictions on youth sports, but what are some changes uh, that you see coming in the professional sports arena? Uh, well, you know, certainly, uh, surprisingly, the valuations, I mean, just continue to go up. I mean, it's just incredible to, you know, to think that uh, uh, what Joe Jacobs bought the uh, Warriors 10 years ago for $500 million, and now they're worth $5.2 billion, or the current Vikings, you know, owners bought the team for, what, $300, $400 million, um, you know, seven or eight years ago, and now the team's worth $3 billion. I mean, those, those numbers are absolutely insane. Um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, I think professional where you can see is probably a lot shorter careers where you see a lot of guys, uh, playing two, three, four years and retiring when they're 26 or 27 years old, they'll have enough money for life. You know, they won't need to continue on. Um, you know, we had seen a lot of really, really good, um, community. Uh, the NHL was amazing on the amount of money they were contributing back into the, uh, community. In fact, they had a, a fund after the last lockout and settlement where the owners and players contributed uh, millions and millions of dollars. I think it was 1% of the revenue every year. And that money had to be put back in the community. Uh, you know, the Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa Bay lightning, the current NHL Stanley cup champs, you know, they've got a program where they're putting a stick 
and a ball in every single kid's hand in uh, Southwest Florida. So that's, I think, 250,000 sticks and balls because they're trying to grow it. So a lot of the uh, the programs, the NFL as well, really put a lot of, they're putting a lot of time and money into the community sports. Um, I know a lot of them are going to take a bath because of COVID. Um, I just hope they don't cut that part of it. I think it's so important, you know, for those guys to give back. Sure. All right, so we're um, getting to our time here. Um, in uh, our talk today, if there was one key takeaway that you'd like our audience to take with them, what would that be? Well, I mean, I think uh, you know, one thing is there's never a bad time to start a business. There's never a bad time to grow a business. Um, and you know, just have confidence in yourself. If you do the work, um, you know, surround yourself with people, um, you know, positive people. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think every entrepreneur, everybody has at some point kind of, you know, fraud may not be the right word, but kind of felt like a fraud or felt like a fake, um, you know, because you're, uh, you're thinking that, oh, once you get to be successful or get to be uh, on a magazine cover or your presidency of a company, somebody, you know, might peel back the curtain, you know, see that you're not a real entrepreneur. You didn't go to Harvard Business School or you don't have the next five years of your business plan, you know, down to the day, uh, but that's okay. And that's 99, you know, percent of us. And I think that's what gives us an edge over the big guys. I mean, there's been so many opportunities I've been able to take advantage of because we were uh, small. Um, so I just, you know, just believing in yourself. If you have doubts, it's perfectly natural. I, I'd, I'd be worried if you didn't, um, you know, I think about Guy Raz uh, from, I love his podcast. Uh, NPR has a, um, show how I built this. And um, he talked to Ron Stake, who's the founder of Panera. And I mean, I, I'd eat a Panera every morning if I could. Um, but, you know, he finally sold Panera. And he said he had the same nightmare over and over that one day he'd wake up in the morning and every one of his customers from across the country would abruptly stop going to Panera. And he eventually had that nightmare so many times he sold Panera. And I mean, just to think if that guy was such an unbelievable restaurant, I mean, they, I mean, they've, absolutely mastered the, kind of the, the fast casual in the mornings. If he can have those fears and doubts, then there's nothing wrong, you know, if, if we have them as well. So, um, you know, it, to me, it comes down to there are going to be fears, there are going to be doubts. Not everything is going to be absolutely perfect all the time, but you got to push forward. And if you have doubts, uh, just push forward and, uh, you know, make the best answer you can, make the best decision you can at the time, you know, and keep moving on. And, you know, certainly surround yourself with other fellow peers, who can, uh, who you can bounce ideas off of. All right. So uh, the gun here, we've got a couple of questions from Darren Lynch, our sponsor, Irish Titan. Chris, I assume you know Darren. Yes, very well. Great guy and great company. Okay. And then uh, a shout out to Irish Titan, irishtitan.com is a website. Uh, they've been supporting Club E for like 10, 12 years, long, long time. Um, Darren and company do a great job and have been um, uh, wonderful to Club E. So I'm giving a little hat tip to Darren because he submitted his two questions right before we were going off the air, but I'm going to take them. Darren would like to know, Steelers or Hawkeyes? Um, for me, uh, Steelers. Okay. Second question, um, what can you do to help either the Steelers or the Hawkeyes? Uh, good question. Uh, but I'm not quite in Darren's click. You know, my, my, my grandmother was Patricia O'Brien. She was one quarter Irish, but uh, I think anybody with less than 99% uh, DNA may not make the cut in uh, Darren's bush, but uh, Darren's uh, boat. But uh, um, I remember Mike Tomlin, the uh, Steelers, obviously uh, uh, coach when he was here as a Vikings. He's just, a, he's a great human being, but uh, uh, ironically, we're doing a lot of NFL work, which we got cut short, but uh, the NFL back to one of your questions was changing. Uh, the NFL is starting to put a lot of people, um, fans, on the field. And uh, in order to do so, they need protection. So uh, many, many NFL teams have come to us um, and put, uh, um, and we put some uh, protection in place for those fans on the field. And uh, just last year, in fact, we did a huge project with the Tampa Bay Bucks um, with, at their practice facility uh, to protect padding, to protect their players. So um, I'd like to think uh, we probably had something to do with their incredible Super Bowl run, I keep all their players safe. All right. So speaking of that, I have to ask, since you're in the sports world, uh, who's going to win the Super Bowl? I've got a very good friend who uh, you talk about adversity. 
uh, got let go from the Vikings and was uh, kind of down and out. And I uh, begged and begged. He finally got a job uh, five years ago with the New England Patriots. Uh, he went to, uh, I think, four Super Bowls, one, three, and two years ago, switched over to the Chiefs. So this guy has been to the Super Bowl. This will be his sixth straight year. So proof that good things happen to good people. So uh, I got to root for the Chiefs in this one just because my good friend is uh, one of their coaches. But Tampa wouldn't be too far behind because uh, they're probably our best NFL customer. So I'm hoping for a tie. Hoping for a tie. Okay, well, that's not going to help the mythical betters out there. But uh, anyway, Chris, uh, for folks to find you, um, what is your email address? Yeah, it's Chris, C-H-R-I-S at Sport Resource Group. So resource, Sport Resource Group, no S on the end of any of those words, you know, dot com. Uh, we're on Twitter, Sport Resource. Uh, that's also my, uh, and that's our website, sportresourcegroup.com. And we got to contact uh, us for them. So if I can answer any questions for anybody or provide a clarification, uh, I'm always happy to. And uh, I just think the future uh, of this country and the future of the world is, uh, is entrepreneurs. And uh, you just got to go out there and, uh, and, and chase your dream. And you know, as my kids say, you know, hopefully you die with memories, you know, not regrets. So that's the, that's the way you got to go about it, looking at starting a company. Absolutely. I die with memories, not regrets. I love it. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Um, look forward to having you back. Uh, I assume if I asked uh, politely, you'd come back. I'd love to. Absolutely love this. And I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you to all the viewers out there. I know time is valuable. So anybody who has spent time watching this, uh, thank you very much. And uh, to all your, your previous speakers, I've gotten so much out of this series. I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Chris. Bye, guys.